to our next Hub 71 talk series. <laughs> Yay, thank you. All right, so uh, first of all, uh, my name is Oko. I'm a senior director at Techstars uh, from the ecosystem development team. I feel like I sit here once a month and talk to some amazing speakers and guests that we get to bring to this community from around the world. And today is definitely not an exception. We have Ian Hathaway with us. So for the next hour, what's gonna happen is that I'm gonna ask Ian a bunch of questions. Uh, we're gonna start with his bio and we're gonna go to, uh, Ian is my former boss. Now I don't like him. <laughs> um, but we're gonna talk about his book that he wrote, uh, which I think is a very important book when it comes to ecosystem development, startup innovation, community building, etc. And then from there, um, once uh, as we get kind of close to the hour mark, I'll open it up so you guys can ask any questions from him. Yeah, so thank you for joining us. And I'll start by asking Ian if you could just introduce yourself, give us a little bit of background about who you are. People know your book, but I don't think people know who you are. So here you are. OK. Thank you uh, for that introduction, Yeah. Oko. He was my best employee. So uh, I'm glad to see that legacy continues today. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm visiting uh, from California. I was actually here on vacation five years ago this very week uh, with my family. So it's kind of an interesting time to come back to Abu Dhabi. Uh, I think I have the greatest job in the world. Um, I get to help entrepreneurs succeed, right? That's the stated mission of Techstars. I feel like my time at that company helped me really realize what I want to do in this world, at least from the work perspective. Um, and it's just that sta statement, helping entrepreneurs succeed. I grew up in a place without a lot of entrepreneurship. I grew up in a small town in Ohio, which is in the US Midwest. Um, manufacturing belt really was part of the Detroit supply chain. Uh, and also the agricultural belt uh, of the United States. The year I was born, the population peaked uh, in my community. So I'm from one of those places that, you know, has kind of been on a steady decline, um, essentially for my entire life. Um, I left that region, but, you know, the impact of that uh, has always been with me. Um, my father was a brilliant inventor. Um, he lacked formal education and engineering. He lacked wealth. He lacked networks. But he was a genius uh, when it came to transportation logistics. Um, he has 80 patents to his name. Didn't go to higher education. Um, but this was just something that was a part of him. However, my dad was not a successful entrepreneur. So crossing that chasm from invention to commercialization and entrepreneurship, it's a very different thing. That has always been with me and it shaped my life uh, in very significant ways. Oko mentioned that I wrote this book on startup communities. Um, I feel like for me, that was a culmination of really my childhood and, and my adulthood. And as I was we were making the final edits to the, to the final draft of this book, I wrote some of what I just explained to you. I ended up taking it out uh, in the last edit because I wanted to tell this story. But what I said was, um, if you kept all the conditions the same with my, my dad's inventions, and instead of being in this small town in Ohio, we had been from Palo Alto, right, San Francisco would the outcome have been different for him? Chances are no, right? It's, it's very rare for people to bring transformative new technologies into the world, scale large businesses around that, but it would have certainly been more likely. And for me, that's what this work around ecosystem building, around startup communities, helping entrepreneurs is really about. It's not about guaranteeing that success will happen, right? It's just improving the likelihood that it will. And 
I think we've all been beneficiaries of, let's say, the last couple of decades, in particular the last decade or so, where this has become a worldwide phenomenon, where more and more individuals are getting involved supporting entrepreneurship in regions all around the world. And so that's really exciting. Thank you for that. Um, so can we go to the book? Can you maybe tell us a story of how, how you come about writing the book, what the book is about, uh, and then from there we'll go to you. Yeah, so um, I'll take a slight step back. That it's really a continuation of you know, what I was saying before. I did not want to be an entrepreneur, right? Entrepreneurship was painful for me. Um, you know, it caused financial hardship for, for my family when I was growing up. Uh, my, my parents split up, and I think in large part because of failed entrepreneurship. So for me, it was something I wanted to avoid. I wanted to do something safe. Uh, I went to school for economics. I was going to be an academic. Um, instead, I went to work for the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve. Um, and unlike in many other countries, our central bank has locations around the country. I happened to be stationed in San Francisco. Um, having nothing to do with an interest in tech or startups. Um, sidebar, I was there during the financial crisis, which was a really interesting experience. Got to live through that and see how we responded, but that's for another time. Um, but really, what got me involved is that everyone at every dinner party I was attending um, or social events, people were doing amazing things. Data science uh, was sort of on the rise. This was the late 2000s. Um, and for me, data science was actually pretty pedestrian for the kind of economic modeling we were doing at the bank. Uh, so I started advising companies. Um, I eventually built my own company and had a successful exit, uh, which took me to, to London. And I was a very reluctant entrepreneur. But along the way, what I really loved doing was, was helping other entrepreneurs. Um, after I had my commitment to the company in London, um, uh, my two-year commitment, I was kind of searching for my next thing. And I wanted to work with entrepreneurs full-time instead of, you know, kind of as my side hustle. I was blogging, I was advising, I was mentoring, and I wanted to make it a job. And my wife, who is much smarter than me, said, well, who is the person you respect the most in the world of startups? And I said, well, there's this kind of wacky guy in Colorado. His name is Brad Feld. Um, we have communicated some by email, uh, but you know, he, would, he doesn't really know me, and why would he help me? And so I sent him this message, and he said, here's my cell phone number. Call me. And we got to talking, and he was like, you know, and we'll get to this a little bit with you know, Brad's background uh, with the book. He had already done a lot of writing on startup communities, um, kind of the foundational work in this field. And he said, uh, listen, your background in economics, like, I think we could actually come together and do something unique. So why don't you write this book with me and come to Techstars and let's build a business around it. And that's really was the catalyst mm. um, behind, behind this book. Um, just maybe going back to just go a little deeper on, on, on Brad in the background of all this. He um, is a successful entrepreneur. He's been a lifelong entrepreneur. Um, as I mentioned, one of the founders of Techstars, and he uh, has been one of the most successful venture capitalists in the US, um, I guess, last couple decades, has been in the Midas list a few times, um, You know, put early money into some of the greatest companies uh, of that era. Um, but what Brad is probably known most for is sharing of knowledge, right? He's written, he basically gave away the playbook on venture capital for the benefit of entrepreneurs, telling them here's exactly how you can get into trouble and bad deals uh, as you sign term sheets, as you lock into these long-term relationships. Um, and the book on startup communities, which really wasn't much of a concept at the time, um, in 2012, Brad was living in Boulder. That's where he's predominantly been. And um, for anyone who doesn't know, Boulder is a small university town in Colorado. It's just outside of Denver. On a per capita basis, tech entrepreneurship is higher 
is second highest in the country only behind San Francisco. It's completely off the charts. Um, Boulder has a lot of things going for it that would encourage tech entrepreneurship, university, federal labs, some legacy industry uh, in computing and in biotech. But that's not really what's driving what's happening there. Boulder is an amazing, amazingly collaborative place. It's small, there's a density place for entrepreneurs to bump into one another. And Brad wrote this book, Startup Communities in 2012, which basically chronicled that experience. Now, Boulder is a unique place. Every place is unique, right? Everyone has to figure out their own blueprint for how they'll build ecosystems and build communities. But the valuable lesson, which you might hear me repeat throughout this conversation, is that Boulder is collaborative. People are proud of the companies they're building and they're always looking for ways to help one another, share resources, share their networks, whatever it is. So regardless of you know, the amount of human capital, physical capital, financial capital you have in a region, you can always be better by simply helping other entrepreneurs succeed. And that's can really I, what this book was all about. Can I pause you there? You keep saying helping entrepreneurs and now you're at a collaborative community. What does that look like in real world, I guess? You know, when you're in Boulder and you want to be a founder, what does that people reaching out to help each other look like? What does the collaboration look like, especially in that small town like Boulder? Yeah, I mean, it's a couple of things. So I guess maybe specifically um, to address the Boulder situation, uh, in Brad's earlier book, there's, uh, he puts forward the Boulder thesis, which is basically four things, four ingredients for having a robust startup community. Um, the first is that entrepreneurs must lead, okay? Um, if entrepreneurs are not out in front leading, it's not a lasting startup community. Founders are busy, right? They can't always be, you know, the driving the change, um, you know, in a community at any given time, but a startup community that's absent of founder-led leadership is not, a, it's not going to, to persist. Um, the second thing is having a long-term commitment. So I think this is actually one of the, this is one of the ways in which people can get tripped up. It takes a long time to develop a startup community. I'll use one example, uh, which is actually in our book about the city of Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, it's actually not that far away from where I grew up. Um, Midwestern city, no real tech grounding at all. Uh, but in 2000, a group of entrepreneurs um, led by Scott Dorsey uh, started a company called Exact Target um, in, two th yeah, in 2000. And as Scott tells the story, that was the only venture deal that occurred in the entire state of Indiana uh, during that year. So it's also on the back of a tech bubble bursting, okay? Worst place, worst time to start a company like this. But they were committed to being there, and so that's where they did it. Flash forward 15 years later, the company is acquired by Salesforce for $2.5 billion. There's now a Salesforce tower in Indianapolis um, I think it employs 2,500 people um, at this time. Maybe that number has come down a little bit in the last year or so. Um, and so by the time Scott and some of his colleagues had spun out um, from Exact Target, now it's 2020. That's 20 years later. That's a generation. Um, but instead of, you know, retiring, uh, you know, and riding into the sunset, Scott actually you know, created a venture firm and studio called High Alpha because he has the long-term ambition for Indianapolis to be the greatest place in the world for B2B SaaS. Will he ever fulfill that? Probably not, but the vision is the correct one. So having that long-term view, that's the second pillar. So entrepreneurs must be leaders, having a long-term commitment to your region, to the cause. Uh, the third is that you know, the startup community must be inclusive. So absent people who are actively harmful, 
anyone who wants to be a part of the startup community is a part of the startup community, right? Um, we must have diversity for innovation to thrive. Um, I look at a place like this, which opens its arms to immigration, like the amazing perspectives that brings, the diversity of thought, of experience, of wisdom. We were talking about this before. That's um, one of the secrets of success to Silicon Valley was actually was built by immigrants, right? The United States was, a, was an amazing beneficiary of that transfer of human capital, um, which actually drove those outcomes. And then the fourth thing is to have constant engagement. So a startup community is not an annual awards dinner. It's not a one-time thing. It's creating spaces like this, having constant you know, contact, opportunities for people to engage, but doing it in a productive way that's a, about building businesses, about helping one another. Um, and so that's kind of the, the flavor, I guess, the, you know, the framework that was used to describe um, why Boulder was so successful because it was following those those four tenets. And for for those of you who don't know, Techstars started in Boulder by Brad Feld and a few other co-founders, and now is uh, according to PitchBook is the most active seed investor in the world. Just now uh, announced again, we run about fifty accelerators around the world, investing in about seven other companies every year, right? And then we also get to work in ecosystem development projects like we are here today. And, and I've been doing this for about a little over 15 years now. Yeah. And Brad Feld's original book, this is the book that Ian and Brad wrote together, but his original book, which is the community startup community, it was also community. Startup community. Startup communities was the Bible for a lot of us for a very long time. When people were starting to talk about this word called community, co-working space were popping up, hubs were coming up, everybody looked at that book, that bolder thesis that Ian just mentioned as our guiding principles, because it encapsulated everything in terms of what you need to do, how you need to think, how you need to approach. So we talk about actors, activities, and attitudes. So these are all of our methodologies that, that was there and that was kind of the, the Bible for a lot of the global ecosystem building activities. And then two of them decided to rewrite the whole thing and we've got a much better, renewed, cool version. So what's the difference between this one, what have you added here, I guess, versus his original thesis and, and book? Yeah, so the original book was essentially founders were the audience you know if you're an entrepreneur building a company here's how you can you know have a more positive experience building that company in this location right here's how you build a community amongst each other where that book got some pushback was that it was very dismissive of other actors being involved with supporting entrepreneurship especially governments right, corporations, universities. Um, some of that was, of course, valid, but it was also oversimplified. So this book is actually really targeted more for all of those other actors, right? How can you effectively engage in a startup community? What are the types of things that you can do to improve entrepreneurship in your community? It's not a replacement for the first book, it's actually a compliment mm -hmm. with a different audience in mind. Yeah, and can you maybe break down a little bit about the theory, the, the systems theory, the complexity theory, and what other methodologies you've utilized? Yeah, I think probably without going you know, too far into all of that, I think the, the most important thing, um, you know, maybe it's a source of, well, first of all, let me just say, we should be really happy about the global movement that's supporting tech entrepreneurship worldwide. Mm -hmm. It really is unprecedented. Um, you know, both the, the pace, the scope, the scale, all of it. Has ha a lot has happened in a very, very short amount of time. 
one of the things I will always ask entrepreneurs, you know, I have the, you know, the, uh, the honor really of coming to places like this, a lot of places around the world and learning. And um, it's easy for people who are in the weeds day to day to be focused on, well, you know, we're not moving fast enough or we're not moving far enough along. And I always say, well, how were things five years ago mm. or 10 years ago? And it's always, um, you know, it kind of blows people back a little bit because they do realize, you know, how far things have come in a short amount of time. But um, really, I think, you know, sort of the disconnect between sort of the founder community and then the broader ecosystem, which supports it, um, is this notion of networks versus hierarchies, mm -hmm. right? When, which entrepreneurs will inherently understand this, building, you know, a modern tech-enabled uh, company, whether it's software or, um, you know, tech-enabled services or whatever, you know, you understand um, inherently that um, you're innovating through a network, right? The resources you need are relationship-driven, um, you're building this thing from the bottom up. It's really innovation at its core. But all of these other actors who are involved, like corporations, investors, governments, universities, are structured in hierarchies, right? Where innovation uh, really doesn't thrive as, as frequently. Um, more importantly, it's not their singular goal, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so this book touches on a lot of that, you know, I guess you could call it agency disconnects, but so where can we all together align around helping entrepreneurs succeed, which is an outcome that we all want. Yeah, and um, is it the first time we met, was it Brett who connected it? Or Cohen or, or I don't remember. Anyway, one of them connected and said, there's a guy who's rewriting the book and maybe you can tell, would you like to submit your story about how you develop communities in Mongolia. And I remember calling him and we, and he was in London and we had this late night call for him, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I was, I was somewhere organizing startup events somewhere around the world in Asia or something. And he told me about his project and he said, Hey, you know, we are working on the original book was really around us centric. Also, a lot of the stories is about Boulder and a lot of the ecosystems, community success lessons learned from the state side. And on this one, they wanted to look at globally and they wanted to source these sidebars. Uh, so you, you had asked me to submit these. Can you elaborate a little more on that? Yeah, um, that was another weakness of the first book yeah. is the US-centric approach, which is not valid for really most other places. In fact, every city is unique even saying the US centric approach is not correct, mm. right? Where I grew up is very different from how I, where I live now. Um, the social fabric, the cultural identity, the, the industrial composition, the history, everything is different and it affects how people approach any number of problems, not just building companies. Um, I do think, you know, <laughs> In the US and some other places, there's an obsession with Silicon Valley, right? It's Silicon Slope, Silicon whatever. It's not helpful. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not practical at all. If you look at the history of Silicon Valley, which is maybe what's more useful, like what gave rise to an incredibly adaptive and innovative region, it was this spirit of collaboration. Right? It's not about recreating what exists today. It's about what got it started. Right? Corporations were more open. Entrepreneurs were committed to the cause. It wasn't just any one company. Uh, it was about putting the advance of technology first. Stanford University was a nothing mm. right, at the time. And there's an incredible book on this um, written by an academic named Annalise Saxanian. She's at, at UC Berkeley. She wrote her doctoral dissertation on Boston, which was far ahead of Silicon Valley, uh, you know, as late as the 1980s, mm. and Silicon Valley, which ultimately surpassed it. And her general view is, it was an openness and collaborative, uh, collaborative spirit 
which enabled Silicon Valley to succeed. And that's a very simple lesson, right? I think if you distill down the essence of that, that's what's valuable, none of the other stuff is. Do you talk about the sidebars, international sidebars in the book? Talk about the international sidebars? Sidebars that you've collected on this one. Uh, which ones specifically? <laughs> where, you know, generally, where were they from, how many? Because you really went on research and you tried to source these stories. You wanted to, you had your head boss and you wanted to prove that this was, this could be a line around the world, that this is kind of common, right? And there are some really good stories from all over the world. Okay. Mine didn't get in, by the way. My writing was not accepted by him. <laughs> well, that was not by design. Uh, I, I know there's some other folks who feel the same way, but yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. That's okay. But yeah, the point was that if you look at the book, there will be many of these amazing stories. The original book was really, again, those uh, communities, but then the book really then sourced a lot of these amazing community work and ecosystem successes that was happening around the world, and they also get to contribute to the book. So it's not just American story. It's not just kind of how Silicon Valley came together, but it's about what works around the world when you see this work, this ecosystem and community building. Yeah, I think also just to say more in real time, um, we haven't talked much about my day job, but um, I run a venture capital fund. We invest really early, um, pre-seed and seed. We actually take a fairly similar approach to Techstars. We provide a lot of mentorship, we'll invest anywhere. And what I will say is we did not set out, we're, we're based in the US, we did not set out to be an emerging markets fund, mm -hmm. but we're slowly nudging in that direction because of the opportunity we see is so obvious, right? Um, the talent, um, the size of the problems that people are dealing with, mm -hmm. right? The relative undercapitalization, right? There's, um, I think that's why we've seen such an immense growth um, in startup activity worldwide. In fact, you know, I did um, a research report in 2018 which documents this. Mm. You see, you know, there's been this huge rise in entrepreneurship worldwide, but actually the share of that happening in the U.S. is declining. Mm. It's still growing like crazy in the U.S., but the rest of the world is rising, and that's an amazing phenomenon. And I can speak from experience that, um, you know, what's happening in these ecosystems is amazing. Right, um, and the opportunity is huge. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about mentor-driven venture capital firm that you are running? Yeah, so I think there's um, there's two aspects of TechStars which are really useful lessons for people to apply um, as you're building startup communities. The first is this element of openness. So um, I don't know how well this is known, but the founding story of Techstars is actually based around this idea of Offset. entrepreneurs leading. So at the time, uh, the person who sort of ideated Techstars is a man named David Cohen. He had recently left his company and he was looking for a way to more meaningfully engage with entrepreneurs besides his angel investing. He lived in Boulder and there was this, you know, at this time, Brad Feld was a famous entrepreneur and investor, and he had this thing called random days. Uh, so very busy person, but one day a month, he would take 20 minute meetings with anyone who wanted to get on his calendar. Now that could sometimes take weeks or months, uh, but it was open for anyone. And one of those people was David Cohen. And he pitched him on this idea of tech stars. And within 10 minutes, Brad immediately decided to invest. And the rest is history. Um, and so I think that's an amazing example of, of entrepreneurial leadership, right? No one is too busy. No one is above one thing. And it's easy to say that, you know, knowing Brad pretty well, I would say tech stars is probably his crowning achievement in the professional world. And so that was a gift that gave back to him, right? Um, and so this is encapsulated in a concept called give first. The second thing that, that 
at least I have gotten from Techstars is this culture of mentorship. So, um, you know, in, uh, in, in fact, the, the company is entirely built around this. And it's, you know, you asked about mentorship driven venture capital. That's, you know, my firm that's actually on our website. That's our motto or our catchphrase, whatever. Um, so that's what we do. Uh, we provide mentorship to entrepreneurs and we happen to have a fund behind that. And we speak of it in that order. Um, and if anyone has been part of a Techstars Accelerator program, there's this concept called mentor madness or mentor magic. I'm not sure if you're doing it in this one, but it's this crazy period where you are, it's essentially speed dating. It's 20 minutes of just, you know, going around the room and, and you know, helping a founder with a problem. And it's an amazingly rewarding experience for everyone involved. I'm still mentoring companies from years ago that I met at a Techstars Accelerator. And so I think that's one of the things that I would stress uh, in any room. And it's also an action item. Whether you're a founder building a company, whether you have been a founder in the past, whether you've never been a founder and never intend to be, but you care about this thing, you care about startups, you, you want entrepreneurs to thrive, be a mentor. And it's possible that you have nothing to offer that entrepreneur in that particular instance. I don't know anything about what you're doing, but I'm here listening to you and I'm, and I'm actively listening and providing support. Maybe three months from now, a story clicks where you meet the exact person that that entrepreneur needs to meet. And that's, you know, kind of how this system works. Mm -hmm. um, it's not efficient, but innovation is not efficient, right? You have to be tolerating, you have to be willing to tolerate a significant amount of, I don't want to call it waste, but a sense of maybe, maybe there was yes. nothing happening there. Yeah. Um, in order for those high value, but low frequency sparks or events to occur. And how do you far out ventures, which is your venture fund? Um, how do you guys embed mentor driven approach into funding startups and supporting your fund? Yeah. So, um, I'd say there's pre-investment phase and post. So pre-investment phase, I'll take a meeting with pretty much any founder, even if they're completely outside of our thesis. I'll tell them that immediately. There's no way we're investing in you because X, Y, Z. We don't invest, we only do B2B software and we like really boring companies solving like financial workflow processes, you know, disrupting, um, you know, sales and marketing for construction and like legacy industries, right? We don't do anything exciting. Uh, we call it big, boring and beautiful. Um, but if you're doing a cool consumer company, I've done a bunch of angel investing in consumer, like I'll help you. And, and if I can't, maybe I know someone who can. Um, so we take that approach. And then obviously on the back end, if we've invested in you, we spend a significant amount of time helping our companies um, because we have operating experience, because we have the mentality and the desire to do that. Um, Everyone says they're a value add VC. Um, well, many do. I think we actually deliver the goods um, and our founders would agree. Yeah, what, what stage do you invest in? What's um, the different information? Yeah, so pre-seed and seed. I would say pre-seed for us is uh, team and TAM. Um, TAM is total addressable market. So, you know, exciting team, big, big market, or at least the right structure of a market. Um, at seed, I would say it's team TAM and traction. So you have customers, you're earning revenue, like there's something happening. Um, yeah. And so how's, how's the market these days? Not great. Uh, I think it's really difficult to be, um, I think it's difficult to be reliant on venture capital right now. Um, founders have been told for a long time, there was a series of guideposts, right? If you do this in revenue, you're growing at this rate, you're going to be worth this much and there's going to be more money downstream. The goalposts have shifted significantly. 
Um, people who had built plans around those goalposts um, are feeling frustrated. Many of them are going out of business. Um, I don't know how this sort of reset, um, you know, ends. Um, I feel like things are going to get better, but I've been saying that for a little while now. Um, 2024 will certainly be an improvement on 2023 and 2022. Um, but I think things are going to be, I don't want to say permanently different because they won't be, right? We're humans. These are cycles. We're going to lose our minds again and valuations will be going like crazy and we'll be investing like crazy again. But when that will happen, I don't know. The best thing founders can do now is, you know, maintain runway, right? Try to reduce your burn. Don't rely on funding um, for the success of your company, uh, which is a fundamentally different thing than what had kind of been the norm for a decade and a half. Great, thank you. I'll ask one more question and I'll open it up to you guys so you can ask a question. As someone who has kind of you know, created a theory and methodology and research ecosystem and community around the world, when you go to a community or ecosystem, what do you look for? What are some signs that you look out for that tells you that this ecosystem is on the right track or not, et cetera? I'm glad you asked that. Uh, we didn't talk about this no, before. So this is not planted, but um, one of the things I do is I try to, it's, two, it's a couple of things. I'll, I'll Google, you know, startup community X, right? Startup community Abu Dhabi, whatever. Can I find, you know, is there a center of gravity in that community? Where are people gathering? Does it exist? That exists. The second thing is I'll cold email people on LinkedIn and say, I'm so-and-so, I'm coming to your community, would you meet with me? And that happened here multiple times. So for me, like those are a couple of little tests that I have is like, how easy is it for me to meet people in a community, right? Some places, you know, I, I know this is being recorded, but my community that I live in now, Santa Barbara, California, is not the easiest place to get plugged in. Mm. It's the same size as Boulder. It's 100,000 people. Um, it's had six unicorns in the last six years. Amazing track record in terms of outputs for a city that size. But where I think that sense of community is maybe you know, driving outcomes in a place like Boulder, I think to some degree Santa Barbara is succeeding in spite of it, right? So um, I don't think using that one example is one place where you can just show up and find the right people. But so far, um, this past, some early tests that I have, and I was gonna tell you about it because it was actually really exciting. I had a lunch today uh, with an entrepreneur who's now a VC who, he didn't know me at all. I reached out to him on LinkedIn and we had lunch. That's, um, awesome. that's a good sign. Yeah, that is good. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, the floor is yours. Do you guys have any questions for Ian, please? Anybody? Please. Yep. Thank you, Ian. Great introduction, great advice. Uh, I'm also a partner, but not in tech field, but in hardware. And my question is whether all that you're talking about is also applied to, I think, more hardware, more, say, more capital, hungry, and other guys. What I'm trying to say, not to look around, it's difficult in my understanding the ecosystem for working, for communicating, but it's all for technologies, right? Who needs only that? People and computer, uh, almost it. We need manufacturing, we need laboratories, we need whatever. Also, we very, very much like to communicate in the very same manner that people are doing here. But it's hard to find. I need to make prototypes, I need to bending, welding, acting, and so on. And I cannot find, uh, at least in UAE, 
such a community or that you join and be a part. So the question is simple whether it is applicable to that part or that guy. So yeah. yes, my <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have a lot of thoughts about that. So first of all, you know, my co-author Brad, you know, he's actually invested in a lot of hardware companies. Uh, Fitbit was one of his companies, for example. Um, so yes, it applies. I think he would agree with me. Um, I guess maybe, uh, well, one question before I respond, are there other people like you here? Like, do you know of other people building hardware companies? We're not here, and then what I'm hungry looking for. So it's a uh, source for any products, and it's hardware, not the computer hardware, actually. We are making uh, advanced waste recycling equipment, so that's it's a huge uh, human body size reactors with conveyor belts, with, uh, with engines, whatsoever. So it's, uh, it's not that. Tiny little things that you could build in your garage. Yeah. So, and, well, I cannot be that. What's your name? Sergey. Sergey. Okay. Yeah, so another way I think about that too is, you know, even if there aren't people that are building companies in the exact domain that you're building a company in, by growing your community, right, building relationships, it only can help you, right? Because there are, other things that are important, whether it's where do I go for this kind of legal advice or a visa, or does anyone know, you know, anyone operating in these industries, right? Who might be your customers. Um, also just, I think there's a social aspect of being around other people who are trying to do highly innovative things. Those are all positive experiences. Even if you don't have, you know, the hardware hackers club of Abu Dhabi in place. And maybe there are more people out there. I don't know, but my belief is that, um, and I think one of the things that we found in Techstars has been that there's been an incredible benefit of going through an experience together. People who are building very different companies that are learning from each other, benefiting from those, you know, tapping into those larger networks and just being a sense of support for one another. And by the way, quick question. Is there anyone here that might have one connection for Sergey? There is one behind you. Okay. By the way, there's a hardware company here, not, not big scale, but smaller consumer scale. There are here, we, I know them, so. <laughs> there's another one over there, so two hands right there. There you go. Yes, three hands. Three hands, there you go. And I know there's one. Um, the other thing that you and me were always also talking about is each ecosystem needs to find their unique, uh, what makes them unique, right? Can you maybe elaborate on that? So he asked about hardware, but you know, how does each ecosystem find their, what, what makes them different and develop and build this Well, this may be, mess. Yeah, it may fly in the face a little bit of, you know, uh, helping Sergey, but um, you know, it can be a few things, right? So I think, every community should look for its existing strengths rather than inventing new ones from whole cloth, right? There's been a multi-decade track record of failed economic development initiatives saying we're gonna be the hub for X, Y, or Z, unless there's a valid reason for that, right? Um, sometimes those are existing, whether it's um, through priorities that are set uh, through public policy, maybe it's strength in corporate environment, uh, whatever it might be, there are existing, you know, um, competitive advantages that one place may have over another. The second thing is that it can be very random, right? If you think back to the story that I was telling before about Indianapolis, it was not a very likely candidate to be a leading, you know, hub for B2B SaaS. But now it is because one company broke through and it created its own center of gravity. And so, you know, I think that's just kind of the point is that every place has existing strengths. Sometimes new companies will break through and create new ones. But unless 
you, yeah, I, I would just caution chasing the, the latest fad and trying to create, you know, uh, a strength around that. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is Michelle. I'm from Balik Bayan Store, the global Filipino marketplace. We are a startup, and uh, right now our status is like you know we have the uh, proven market and traction, and we are starting up our uh, expansion to the USA, which we have chosen Delaware. Um, since you are based in USA and you supported uh, so many startups there. What would you advise in terms of uh, us expanding uh, to the United States through Delaware entry? And uh, our focus mainly is the global Filipinos, which right now in USA is around 4 million. And uh, you know, the, the target reach that we or the uh, serviceable market. Uh, it's uh, around fifty billion dollar industry of global Filipino sending goods plus money remittance and travel and tourism. So, what would you advise for us uh, as a startup uh, uh, to scale it up in the USA and as a global Filipino marketplace, servicing or uh, trying to reach uh, at least five percent of around twelve billion uh, Filipinos around the globe? Well done, uh, pitching to him, huh? Good job. So first of all, one clarification. So you're incorporating in Delaware. You're not growing in Delaware. Incorporating, but um, yeah. servicing the Filipinos there in, uh, in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, but not in Delaware. So I guess my advice would be is like, you know, that's a legal aspect. You're incorporating in, in one state, but I, my guess is that that's not where the Filipinos are located. California, where else? California, uh, majority California, uh, more or less two million. Yeah, so I guess the advice I would give you is if you know I was evaluating your company um, as an investor, which again I would not because I don't do B two C, um, would be what is the niche market that you can go the deepest in? Is if it's Los Angeles or I don't know where that concentration is. Um, building out a sales team there. Right, people who can unlock that revenue quickly for you and demonstrate, um, you know, that early traction. So, you, if you're going for outside capital, that um, you would be able to, you know, to show that early traction, those numbers that would be interesting to investors. What about what about the taxation there? What about what? Taxation. <laughs> yeah, well, if your company is massively successful, you're going to have a big tax bill to the U.S. government. That's what about. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, thank you for spending your time with us. Uh, my question is around uh, locations or about similar to to Abu in Dubai, where it's uh, quite diverse but also quite uh, transitory for a lot of people. So a lot of people visiting, traveling, mm. uh, you know, among those. So how do you see the development? sustainable community with that influx and movement of people? Yeah, so I think um, that's a great question. So you're talking about something that is both an advantage, right, the diversity, and maybe a disadvantage, and that it's transitory. Um, I don't really have a great answer for that other than to say, you know, why is it transitory? Is there a way to get people excited about staying here for the long term? Um, I think that's where the most vibrant startup communities take shape. It's in places where people are committed for the long haul, right? Where you're saying, look, I'm putting roots down here. I'm building this company here. Um, and just the general cycle of all of this for the, if you subscribe to the view that I definitely subscribe to, which is that one big outcome one large scale exit, however you want to define that, can literally redefine the entire region. It's not, we're not talking about averages, we're talking about outliers, right? Um, we're talking about power law outcomes, nonlinear you know, transformations of a region. 
It can just take that one. It takes a decade or more, right? And in my experience, I don't know if I have built a company in a place, you know, 10, 15, maybe 20 years, I've had success. I've raised my family in that place. I think those are the type of things you're looking for where, where people will stay. Um, but, you know, to your point, it's both a blessing and a curse, right? Um, the only answer I have to say is, you know, uh, create a platform, create a community, create an environment where people feel welcomed, they feel safe, they want to they want to be here. That's really the best you can do, you know. I don't think I'll give away a secret if I say this, but our last cohort of F seventy one right now, half of the cohort is deciding to stay. So maybe there's real work happening here. Yeah. So Julian, you talked about one of the criticisms and embrace this book was that it's usually some of the partners like John Max would give it that much area. Looking now at the single board governments are doing, can you do this as some examples of successful government policies or programs around the world that are really hard to tell you just? Well, you know, of course it's easy for me to say this here, but you know, a lot of what I've seen so far and what Oko has described to me is very impressive. Um, I think that, you know, where governments have made mistakes in the past is that they are setting the vision, but then also trying to go too far downstream and provide the programming, right? So I think getting organizations like Techstars involved is really smart. Um, putting support and investment behind many companies, making a long-term commitment. These are the ingredients for success. Um, in government, failure is a very dirty word, right? But the reality, and I wish we had a better word for failure, because um, it does feel punitive, right? It feels harsh. But the reality is the most likely outcome for, your, for any startup is that it will fail. Right? I was just talking about this this morning, that if 25% of the companies I invest in make it to Series A, which is just the beginning of that journey, I'm doing really well. That's a harsh reality. And so there's an aversion in government to want to prevent failure, to pull back too early, right? to not make those long-term commitments. And, you know, so that's... I guess basically my advice is to say, cool, set the vision. Here's the outcome we want. We want economic growth driven by entrepreneurs, or we have societal problems we think entrepreneurs can help solve. Set that vision, that mission, and look for people who can actually help you achieve that. Don't be the ones delivering the programming per se, which is typically what governments do, right? Education policy, for example, right? In the United States, the policy is set at the states, the schools, my children go to, well, two of my kids go to public schools, right? Um, so that's an example where that would be the water's edge, right? And, and you wouldn't take that additional step. So those are the kind of things that I think make successful government policy. Um, I wrote a blog post about this. Uh, I don't think it's in this book, but it called it Platforms Versus Pipes. Deliver the platform and just let let the you know the interaction let the let the innovators do their thing don't get tied to too many outcomes specific outcomes and don't have that short-term time horizon um just let it unfold great so on that note we're gonna end today's session thank you very much everybody for attending thank you to Ian for taking his time he's gonna be around for a little bit so you guys can go and come and talk to him and ask your questions. Thank you.